Good day, uni students. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Today we're going to have a look at probably the most important uh, topic in undergraduate mathematics, which is the calculus. All right, so we're going to review some basic terminology and notation, and I'm also going to give you a kind of bird's eye, relatively quick summary of some of the things that hopefully you will know, or ought to know, when you come to university or college. Okay, so calculus has sort of two aspects. There's the differential calculus and the integral calculus. Let's just run over quickly some of the aspects of these two different parts of the subject. The differential calculus is motivated by rates of change and by motion. And a key driver was Newton's laws of motion. It deals also with the geometry of tangent lines and slopes of tangents. Allows you to calculate maxima and minima of functions. The derivative, of course, plays a key role. And the topic of differentials is also very important, very closely connected historically to the derivative. And then there are Taylor series approximations of functions, which are natural um, sort of aspects of the differential calculus. With the integral calculus, we are interested in questions of areas and volumes. And we're interested in solving Newton's laws for motion, trying to find out what a trajectory actually is, given some forces. Prominently, the integral plays the key role. There's a very important theorem called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. And there's also interesting numerical aspects, because often in practice we can't actually integrate completely, so we have to have an approximate view of things. And there's also many other applications physically oriented towards centers of mass and moments and so on. So we'll have a look at some of these topics, but not all of them today, very briefly. Basically, the calculus gives us a way of going from qualitative descriptions of the world to quantitative descriptions. These are two interesting words that you should be familiar with. So qualitative is built on the word quality in the sense of a property or an aspect of something in a kind of a descriptive way. For example, that object might be hot or that building might be high, etc. Quantitative is a word based on the word quantity. So there's a numerical aspect. We're not interested so much in whether it's hot or not, but how hot it is. And not whether it's high or not, but how high it is. So, Calculus gives us a very important tool to become quantitative about a lot of the aspects of the world around us. To not just speak in general terms, but to actually be specific and to introduce numbers and quantities to describe motions, areas, and many other things. Very powerful tool. Okay, so a key historical motivation for calculus is to understand how things move study of motion. And a very simple but important example is what happens to an object when you throw it up into the air. Okay, so I'm throwing this up in the air and it's obviously it's going up and it's going down. That's a qualitative description. But we would also like to have a quantitative description. We would like to know, well, what actually happens to it on the way up and the way down? What about its speed? What about its acceleration? So the uh, calculus really has its origins in the study of this very important example. So here's a fellow, perhaps you or me, and we're throwing a ball up in the air. And let's assume that this axis here, the vertical axis, is say the y-axis. And it's been uh, labeled with some uh, measurement, say meters. Okay. So a natural question is, how do we describe where the ball is, when. So here is a time position diagram that has an axis here, labeled T for time, and the vertical axis is the same Y axis we're talking about here. So we can describe the trajectory of this ball or object via what it does at various times. So here, this path here is telling us that at time t equals zero, the ball is at one. Let's say it starts off down here. And then as time progresses, the ball is moving up. 
and around here it achieves a maximum value and then it keeps on coming down and at this time here it hits the ground. So the graph here represents a pictorial representation of the, the motion of the, uh, the ball or the object incorporating not just the position but also the time. And so it's key to try to understand what shape this function has. Well, it turns out that it's a parabola. Okay? And it's a parabola that has some equation that looks something like this. So it's a function of t, because t is now the independent variable. So y is, say, minus g t squared over 2 plus v0 t plus y0. And obtaining this uh, formula was sort of one of the first successes of the calculus way of thinking. Alright, so the key to understanding this situation is to think not just about position, but also to think about velocity and acceleration. So if we're thinking about speed or velocity, at this point here the ball has an upwards velocity which is quite high. It maintains an upward velocity, but that velocity or speed starts to decrease. It starts to slow down as it gets to the top. That's represented in this picture by the slope of the tangent. And when it gets to the maximum value, well then actually the ball is instantaneously stationary. So it has a velocity of zero just at this maximum value. And then after that, the velocity is negative and it starts to become more and more negative. So it goes down here like this. The form for the velocity with respect to time is the equation of a line. That's a key fact that in fact the velocity is linearly dependent on the time. And if we look at the slope of this uh, line, well that's the acceleration and that's uh, a constant. So basically in this diagram is contained Newton's key um, idea or understanding that it's the acceleration which is constant which is sort of responsible for the velocity having this form and it's the velocity having this form that's responsible for the position having this form. Okay. And Newton framed his laws in terms of acceleration and so this problem of how to go from the acceleration knowing the acceleration to how to go to knowing the position is a key motivating problem for calculus. Okay, so Galileo also contributed in a big way here. We really have three different diagrams, time and position, time and velocity, time and acceleration, and the relative relationships between these three diagrams uh, basically is at the heart of both the differential calculus and the integral calculus. So let's have a look at this relationship between position and velocity. Okay, so here's a similar kind of diagram as before, but now I'm going to call this axis the x-axis, reminding us that the velocity that we're interested in might not necessarily be a vertical one. It could also be one that's horizontal. All right. But nevertheless, time is going to be our independent axis down here. Okay, so here is the trajectory of a particle telling us where a particle is, what the x-coordinate is, at any given time value. It's describing a one-dimensional motion along an, an axis labeled x. And we can start off with the idea of the average speed. So we might be interested in the particle at time t1, at which point it has position x1, and at time t2, where its position is x2. Then the speed, or the average speed, of the particle in that interval from t1 to t2 is expressed this way. The change in x over the change in t. So this triangle here, in the context of calculus, means a change, a difference. Okay? So specifically, this is the difference between x2 and x1. And this is the difference between t2 and t1. So the change in position divided by the change in time, that's the speed, or the average speed in this period. And now on our graph, we're talking about going from this point to this point. 
And in this diagram here, this triangle is a right triangle, and this side here is delta t, and this side here is delta x. So this ratio of delta x over delta t is what we call the slope of this line A1, A2. Sometimes called a secant line because it joins two different points of a curve. Okay, let me also just point out, we talked about maximum before. So here is a, a little value, a little sort of a top of a hill. That's called a local maximum. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a, the largest value altogether, but it's bigger than the nearby values. So local means in the neighborhood or around the value. This is a local maximum, and correspondingly here is a local minimum. And um, maybe I should tell you that the plural of maximum is maxima. Right? If you have one maximum, three maxima. Similarly, the plural of minimum is minima. Okay, so to go from the idea of average speed to the idea of instantaneous speed is an important thing. So let's talk about the instantaneous speed at a point. Not over an interval, but at a point. So what we do there, the idea is to have a look at this average speed between T1 and T2, and then think what happens if T2 gets closer and closer and closer to T1. Right? So this secant line, which is currently here, will move like this. Okay, as T2 approaches T1, it will move like this, and it will sort of have this limiting value here. So this ratio that defined the speed before will have a limit. And that limit is called the instantaneous speed at the point T1. Okay, and here's the notation that we use. We say limit as T2 approaches T1, or limit as T2 goes to T1, of x2 minus x1 over T2 minus T1. Geometrically, that's the slope of the tangent at A1, which in this case is this line here, A1B. Okay. Tangent is the line that approximates the curve best at a particular point. At every point there's a tangent. Here's the tangent there, here the tangent is there, here the tangent is there, so on. Now this limit defines what's called a derivative, really. So this is uh, x prime of t1. If you think of this as a function, then the slope of this tangent here is called x prime of t1. It's actually the derivative. It has different notation, sometimes with a prime, sometimes a d by dt. So d by dt of x at t1. And Newton and physicists often use this notation for the derivative an x with a dot of t1. That also means the derivative. Usually the dot means derivative with respect to time. It's especially important when we're dealing with motion, something that's depending on time. Right. So this is the concept of the instantaneous speed at a point, which is no longer just a single quotient, but it's the limit of a quotient. So there's some limiting process involved so a little bit more sophisticated, and that's the origin of the idea of the derivative. So derivative is really, from a motion point of view, getting at the instantaneous velocity of a moving particle. But geometrically, it's the slope of a tangent line. All right, so that whole story coming from physics has a mathematical formulation where we dispense with time and just move to x and y coordinates. So somewhat more generally, we think of having a function. So f of x is a function of x. So x is now the independent variable, y is the dependent variable, and we write y equals f of x, meaning that y is a function of x. Given a value of x, say x equals zero, the function tells us what the y value is. So when x is 0, f of 0 is 2. Uh, when f is 2, f of 2 is about 1.3. When f of 4 is 0, f of 5 is uh, maybe 3. 
Okay, and this, what we're plotting here, is called the graph of the function. We're basically plotting points of the form x, comma, f of x. So here we're plotting 2 and f of 2. We're doing that for a lot of range of values of x, and we get the graph of the function. Alright, so now in this context, what we did before, here is the derivative at some point a. Alright, so here, a is a particular value of x, a particular value on this line. It might be, for example, 2. Okay, so we're going to define f prime at a, or f prime at 2. And what is it? Well, it's the limit as x approaches a of the same kind of ratio that we had before. The function's value at a nearby point x minus the function's value at a divided by x minus a. So let's have a look at the uh, situation here. So for example, if this is our point a, and here is our point uh, x, then when here is f of a, and here is f of x. And this ratio represents the slope of this secant line. Here's the secant line that passes through this point and this point here. All right, so that ha line has a certain slope, that's this quantity here. And then we move this x, which is a little bit smudged, we move this x towards A, letting this point move towards our original point, and then this secant approaches the tangent. Now another way of writing this is to think about the difference between a and x. So this quantity here, we call that h, which is just the difference between x and a, in other words this quantity here. Then we can rewrite the definition of the derivative in this fashion. The limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h, which would be this point here, minus f of a all over h. All right, and the notation for the derivative is either f prime of a, or perhaps df dx of a, and sometimes a capital D, d of f of a. This is the derivative of the function f of x at the point a. Geometrically here it's more representing a slope of a tangent because we no longer have time involved, but we do have this idea of a secant line moving towards a tangent. And the derivative is the slope of that tangent. Now we've defined the derivative at a point a. We can also consider the derivative as a function. So we can consider the derivative f prime of a at all points a at the same time we get a new function called f prime of x. So this is the same definition really, but thinking of x as an arbitrary point rather than a fixed point. It's called the derivative of the whole function f of x. Okay, and then we learn in high school, hopefully, various formulas for important derivatives. The most important one is this one here, that the derivative of the function x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. That's kind of key uh, formula for the derivative. We also learn that the derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function, that the derivative of sine is cosine, that the derivative of cosine is minus sine, that the derivative of log x is 1 over x, that the derivative of cosh x is shine x, or cinch x. That the derivative of shine x, or cinch x, is cosh x. And we learn various rules that the derivative satisfies. The simplest ones being the linearity property. This is called the linear property of the derivative. If you take the derivative of a sum of two functions, you get the derivative of the first one plus the derivative of the second one. And if you take the derivative of a multiple, where lambda is a number, lambda f prime, you get lambda times f prime. We also have the product rule, 
which tells us how to take the derivative of a product of two functions, and the quotient rule, which tells us how to take the derivative of a quotient f over g. The original pioneers of calculus, Newton, Leibniz, Euler, and their contemporaries, didn't think exactly along the lines of limits the way we do now. They thought rather in terms of differentials. And it's important to at least be aware of what these things are. So the differential is a slightly problematic term because it refers to an infinitesimally small change. It's not so clear what exactly it means, but it's practically a very fruitful and powerful idea. So this is the way they thought about things. If you have some function y equals f of x, say this one here, and you have some point x, and you have some point y, then you might be interested in what happens if you change x by an infinitesimal amount dx. So not just a small amount, but a really, 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 really small amount. In fact, an infinitesimally small amount, whatever that means. Okay. Well, then y, which is related to x via this function, y equals fx, will also change. It will also change by some infinitesimally small amount dy. And then they thought about the derivative as being the ratio of those two infinitesimal changes. x changes by an infinitesimal amount dx, y changes by an infinitesimal amount dy. So the derivative of the function at the point x, at this point here, is the ratio of dy over dx. So this was more than just notation for the 17th century mathematicians. It was actually really defining what the derivative was. These quantities dx and dy, these infinitely small quantities, infinitesimal quantities, are often called the differentials, differentials of x and y. And let me illustrate the idea with an example which I think makes it a little bit clearer. Suppose that we have a simple situation where y equals x squared, relatively simple function of x. Now, if you take this function and you evaluate it at x plus some infinitesimal small change dx, dx is a very, very small increment, then the function is to take this and squares it. So if you square x plus dx, you get x squared plus 2 times the product, 2x dx, plus the square of the last term, which is dx squared. And the point is that if dx is very, very small, or infinitesimally small, then dx squared will be super duper duper small, or basically zero. And so we can ignore the dx squared. So we just get that this is more or less x squared plus 2x dx. All right. So that's going to be the original y value when we were evaluating at x, plus the change in y. And then if you look at this, you see that, okay, the change in y, dy, is 2x dx. This is how much the function changed when you changed x by dx. So dy is 2x dx. This differential relation was a very important relation for the 17th, 18th century mathematicians, and is still very important for physics and engineering applications. So even today, a lot of applications will prefer to work at the level of differentials, namely this equation, rather than the more official uh, version of dy dx equals 2x, which you obtain by taking the ratio of the two differentials. Right. So in pure mathematics courses, you learn this. You don't often learn this, but this is still important, and important especially for physics and engineering applications. Although what exactly the dy and the dx are are somewhat more problematic, for sure, in, uh, in this view. One advantage to thinking about differentials is that the chain rule is particularly simple. So if y equals a function of x, say f of x, and z is a function of y, say g of y, so y depends on x, and z depends on y, well then z depends on x. 
then z is equal to g of f of x. It's called a composite function. And the chain rule says that if you want to know what the derivative of z with respect to x is, dz dx, it's dz dy, the ratio of the differentials here, times dy dx, the ratio of the differentials there. And when you state the chain rule like this, it's easy to understand and almost obvious. Okay, now let's move to the integral calculus, which is primarily concerned with areas. Okay, so here is a function, y equals f of x. Here is an interval on the x-axis, a to b. And fundamental question of the integral calculus is, how much area is there underneath the graph between x equals a and x equals b? So this area is denoted by this symbol. And we read the integral of f of x from x equals a to x equals b. So the integral of f of x from x equals a to x equals b. Or we might say the integral from a to b of f of x dx. You can say either of those things. And what is the definition? Well, the definition is a little bit complicated, but it's basically some kind of limiting procedure of what are called Riemann sums of rectangular areas. So basically, we're taking a subdivision of the interval AB, subdividing it up in some relatively fine way, and then above each one of these intervals, we create a rectangle which goes up to the function. So here we go up to the function, then we create a rectangle. Here we go up to the function, create a rectangle, and so on. And here at this point x, we've gone up to the function and create a rectangle. Now this area here, the area of this rectangle, is the height times the base. The height will be f of x. And the base, well, we can think of the base as being that small change in uh, x from here to here. Say dx. All right, this is suggesting that, in fact, we're not just thinking of a concrete uh, change. The 18th century, 17th century people thought of dx as actually being an infinitesimal uh, small quantity. And so this was an infinitesimally thin rectangle. And that's basically Leibniz's idea here that what we're doing is we're summing up all these infinitesimally thin rectangles. And when we do that, we get the area or the integral. This is called a definite integral. It's an important term because the bounds a to b are definite. There's a fixed value of a, there's a fixed value of b. We're talking about a particular interval. We want to know the area under that particular interval. That's called a definite integral. And the most important formula for a definite integral is this one. It's Cavalieri's formula, which says that the integral from 0 to a of the function x to the n dx is a to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. That's a fundamental formula for the integral calculus. And if you're interested in a, how to derive this, it's a very important problem, you might have a look at my famous math problem series, number 10. It talks all about this very important uh, problem. In fact, it gives a somewhat novel way of thinking about why this fundamental fact is true. All right, so there's another kind of integral besides the definite integral called an indefinite integral. And while a definite integral is a number, the indefinite integral of a function is another function. This is very similar to what we were doing with derivatives. If we have a function f of x, we can take the derivative at a point a, giving us a number, or we can take the derivative at a variable point x, giving us essentially a new function, which we call the derivative of the original function. So similarly here, if we have a function little f of x, here's its graph, we could take the integral over some fixed interval, a, b, that would give us a number. But we could also take the integral from 0 to a variable point x. So here is 0, here is x. We're thinking of this x as possibly variable. 
and then the integral from 0 to x is the area under the function from 0 to x. And that's going to depend on x, and so it's going to define a new function, which we might call capital F of x. So capital F of x is the, the indefinite integral of f of x, indefinite integral. And I need to point out that the variable here is not x anymore. I've changed it to t. Could have also changed it to u or anything else, really. So there's a convention that says that when we're talking about integrals like this, the actual variable of integration that's appearing here in the dt and in the function inside here doesn't matter. Okay? If we replace the t with an x, or the x with a y, or the y with a z, or the z with a u, the integral is still the same. So we change it to t here so that we're not possibly confused by the meaning of the variable there and this variable x that we're introducing as the upper bound. All right, let's have a look at this example. Okay. So when x is 0, then we're talking about an area of 0 because the rectangle is basically has 0 width. And then as x moves over here, well, the area is going to start to increase. And here is the area, the capital F of x function. So as x moves along, the area is increasing. Okay? And it's still increasing along here. But once we get to x over here, then uh, the capital F of x function has a maximum because if we go a little bit further and we're integrating a ne negative function, then the integral is negative. And so it contributes to decreasing the total integral. That's why there's a bit of a maximum here corresponding to that zero there. And then the capital F of x function decreases for a while. And then when little f of x becomes positive again, and then capital F of x uh, will increase. All right, so given any function little f of x, we can cook up this indefinite integral, capital F of x. And here's the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is really the key point that connects the differential calculus with the integral calculus. It is that the derivative of this capital F function is the original function little f. So we've obtained capital F by integrating little f. We can recover little f by differentiating capital F. So integration and differentiation are, in some sense, inverse operations. And let me point out that there are, in fact, other possible indefinite integrals. Because there was something of an arbitrary choice in putting a zero here. If we put something else, for example, a 1, then we could define another function, which also can be called an indefinite integral of little f of x. So this would be g of x, the integral from 1 to x of f of t dt. It also has this property. In fact, the relationship between f of x and g of x is pretty easy to see, because the integral from 0 to x equals the integral from 0 to 1, plus the integral from 1 to x. So capital F of x is g of x plus this integral from 0 to 1 of f of t dt. And, uh, and that's a constant. that doesn't depend on x. So in this picture here, if we wanted to graph uh, g of x, what we would do is we would realize that g of x is 0 when x is equal to 1. Okay? And the difference here this difference is the, the area under f of x from 0 to 1. That's a constant. That's that fixed difference. So that difference is going to be maintained. This g of x function is always just underneath uh, the f of x function, always separated by the same constant, namely that number there. And that kind of makes it obvious that at any point, the derivative of the capital F function and the derivative of the capital G function are going to be the same. Right? The slope of the tangent here and the slope of the tangent here are going to be the same because they're parallel. 
Okay, so that's the fundamental theorem of calculus um, and the indefinite integral as opposed to the definite integral. And so to wrap things up, let's go back to the original motivating example of throwing an object into the air, where the time position graph looked like a parabola, where the time velocity graph looked like a straight line going down, and where the time acceleration graph was a constant. So these are the three formulas for the acceleration as a function of time, for the velocity as a function of time, and for the position y as a function of time. And they involve these constants, g, which is the acceleration due to gravity, v0, which happens to be the initial velocity, and y0, which is the initial uh, position. Okay, so uh, it's instructive to look at these equations and to understand that if you take the derivative of this function, you get this one here. And if you take the derivative of the velocity, you get the acceleration. And complementary to that are integration formulas that go the other way around. So the velocity is the integral of the acceleration. Okay, it's an integral, but it's an indefinite integral, so it, it's determined only up to a constant. So if you write 0 to t a u d u, it still um, has to be adjusted up and down to what it, you want it to be. And that's the role of this v0 here, ensuring that when you put t equal to 0, okay, that you're getting the velocity v0 that you're assuming you're starting with. This is typical. This is called a constant of integration. When you integrate, you have to often put a constant of integration uh, there to adjust the function. And similarly, to go from here to here, we integrate it's the inverse of differentiation. So y of t is the integral of v of u du from 0 to t, plus again a constant of integration, which is there to adjust the fact that when you put y equal to 0, this is going to be 0. And we're assuming we're starting at some initial position, y0. So we put that in there. All right, so this is a key example for calculus. Derivatives going this way, integration going this way. And Newton's law telling us that f equals ma. And uh, so the acceleration is determined by the force. If you know the force, then you know the acceleration. And then the calculus allows you, with two integrations, to obtain first the velocity from the acceleration, and then obtain the position from the velocity. This is part of the reason why integration is so important, because it allows us to extract from Newton's law the position of a particle if we know the forces that are acting on it. The forces determine the acceleration, and two integrations give us the position. All right, so that's been a fast and furious overview of calculus. Perhaps some of those ideas are unfamiliar to you. Now you at least have a little bit of an idea, and I hope you've benefited from seeing the terminology in practice. So this ends our series of terminology lectures, but I would like to give you one more lecture which is related to this material and is a lecture about how to actually write mathematics. Right? When you're writing a test, when you're writing an exam, when you're writing an assignment, you're actually expressing yourself mathematically. What are some guidelines to help you do that successfully? We're going to talk about that in our last video of our little course. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Walberger. We'll see you all next time.